any questions on any of the stuff you're working on, Gabby, or you just moved along well? Oh, did you add your name to the tombstone over there? Yes. Now's the time to start adding text and adding some life to this. So it's, you know, more than just Ken Burns and transitions. But some really stylish type animations will really make this pop. Like, even if you have a deep Z space particle system of just some dust in here that'll add some life to it and push that scene a little bit further maybe some scraps of paper blowing around and here maybe some leaves rustling And that's a bit fast there. Maybe when the person pops out, you could puppet pin the arm to look like it's reaching towards the camera. And you could put pins in the fingers to give them some life as well. But it's looking pretty good so far. Like I said, it's just little elements like that to each of these scenes that will really separate it from other people's work and not that but it'll show a variety of techniques more than like I said more than Ken Burns and doing some transitions in this shot it's a bit fast like because you're going from transition to here hangs on it for a moment and then you got your jaws transition real fast so if this were up just a little longer and something happened, like even if it's the clouds moving um, overhead, that would be huge for helping push this and add a little interest. So it's looking pretty good. It's a good start. You got plenty of time till this is done. So if you come up with some type things that inspire you or you find some reference and you want me to help you break it down, let me know. Yeah, like the type you add in can be parts of the credit sequence. Oh, okay, that's that's pretty easy. Um, so we've got this image, and this one is, yeah, I think the best thing is to bring that into Photoshop and knock out the sky and then put a sky in it. Okay, so once you have your building silhouetted out. Obviously, this guy's going to be behind them. And of course, I grabbed a small image, but oh well. You're just going to do a small movement across a uh, slow amount of time. You know, as part of the... You see how even something like that, they don't even need to be moving that fast, but even something like that adds a bit more interest than just the still shot yeah you could even find a moody sky however you want or you could use this as reference um, and say okay I want the clouds at about this you know darkness and this amount if you, you like that look so it's all just a matter of remember your horizons about the lower third of the screen in this shot so you're going to need them to at least cover that much. And good evening to everyone else who popped in. I'm going to hop over, check the mail. And again, tonight I'm fielding all questions. It's full lab time. I'm going to help everybody stay on track, get their projects done. And so everyone could just breathe a sigh of relief. But when you're working on your type, Gabby, make sure your font makes sense. It fits with the theme. Uh, texture is really going to help it. Um, maybe you could add things to it, like uh, maybe some monster hands or blood dripping or something like that, spiders crawling on it. Anything to add some interest to the type would be good. In all the cutaway and B-roll you're showing, it doesn't have to just be establishing shots 
of buildings. You could put whatever you want in between to keep adding to the mood of this opener. It doesn't have to just be architectural. And that'll help create a mood and tell a story. Okay. Let me hop out of here. You want to duplicate an animation properly. Oh, okay. All right, all right, all right. You're doing blinking. All right. So here's one eye. Remember, you always want to set your anchor points before you animate. Save yourself some trouble. And just a reminder, the pan behind tool right up here, that's how you move the anchor points. So here's the one eye and I'm going to hit command D to duplicate and move all the stuff up to the top. This will be the other eye. And you want to duplicate a blink. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to animate the path for each of these shapes. And we got that by twirling down the contents. So that's the bottom lid. And here's the top lid. And we're going to go forward a few frames because it only takes a couple frames for that blink. I'm going to create a new keyframe by clicking the empty diamond. And now I can go in and edit those shapes. So I can move this down, that one down, that one down, like such. And remember, you could also animate the curve handles and the, the uh, Bezier curves, as well as the anchor points. I mean, the pen path points. So we'll pretend that's good. That's actually pretty decent. First thing we're gonna do, I just hit the U key to hide all that garbage. I'm going to easy ease these. I right clicked and chose easy ease. So there's the eye open. And then you go to where you want it to blink Click your blank keyframes because this is the way that it looks when it's blinked and when it's open. And then you move forward and choose the closed ones. You gotta do it for each layer individually, sorry. And it'll paste where the playhead is. And I'm like a silly person, I forgot it's only a couple frames for the blink. And then we're gonna need that eye open. And so let's pretend that's the way you want it to look. And then what you could do is get those lids and pre-compose them, move all attributes into new comp. And what I do when I'm working with pre-comps, I trim the layer to where the animation stops. Like there's no animation passed here. And so I just go here and I hit Alt or Option and the bracket that's two away from the letter P to trim that layer. And I can duplicate this now. And I'll just move it over where my other eye is. I'll have it line up. And if I wanted, I could pre-compose these together. I call them two lids. Then I move to where the animation stops and I can trim it. Point out Alt or Option and the one that's two away from the uh, letter P. And then all I simply have to do now that I've trimmed this, I can go to wherever I want the blinking to happen again and duplicate this. And if I drag it and hold down Shift, it'll snap to where the playhead is. I can just duplicate it again, move the playhead, hold down Shift, and it'll snap to wherever the playhead is. That help you out? In a nutshell, just
just get your lids perfect for the open and the close and you just keep duplicating those keyframes and then you pre-compose it together. Hopefully that helped you out there, Carmen. So like I said, when you get repeated motion like that, to do it perfectly once, like one perfectly open eyelid, one perfectly closed eyelid, and then you just copy and paste those perfect ones in the right order. So it's, you know, closing, then opening, closing, then opening, and then pre-composing them so nothing moves around, and then shorten your pre-comp so you can see how long that animation is and more accurately place it where you want it to go. And let's kick this up a notch because your characters will probably be moving. So this is my face. I'll rename it face. Don't forget, you're going to want to parent the eyes to the face, the iris to the eye, the pupil to the iris. And then this is the next eye. So this one will get put there. And that one will get sent there. Now these lids will get parented to the face. So if the person's head moves, let's go from position here, and then they move. Oh, I missed one of the eyes. Let's see, right here. This has to go to the face. Now I can add my keyframe, move it. Now it's all going to move together. And if in between the blinks, I want the these to move a little bit. So let me just rotate that. You're not going to see that because it's a circle. We'll do position then. Those will move together because I parented them together. Don't forget to ease your keyframes whenever and wherever possible. Well, if you got multiple layers happening, just remember that uh, you copy them properly. Like I had to do one layer at a time. So it's like if I copied this, I had to move my playhead and then copy it there. Same thing, copy it and then don't move the playhead and paste it because you're copying the keyframes within layers. You can't copy across the layers like that. Yes, yeah, so remember parenting things together will help them stay together a lot better. And also, this will help you out. We'll kick it up a notch as well. This white of the eye. You don't want the iris and the pupil to go outside of it. So I'm going to duplicate this and place it above my iris and pupil. These I can pre-compose together. Because remember, a mat is one layer revealing one mat. So I'll call this a uh, pupil. Move all attributes into new comp. So now I can have this as my alpha mat so that pupil never goes out of it. Remember, these are your switches. Hit switches and modes. These are your modes. I set the layer beneath it. So the mat goes above. I click on the layer below and I choose my alpha mat. And now my pupil will never go outside of that. It always stays inside it. I just have to make sure that I reparent this to the face afterward. Like I said, just make sure any new pre-comps you do, make sure they're parented the way they should be. And don't forget, if you've got a font, you can always convert it to shapes by right clicking and go create, create shapes from text, or you could also make a mask. So I'm, I'm going to turn this into shapes first. Oops, that's a mask. That's fine. So I'm going to do something different with that. And you can also um, use effects on your fonts if you need to over time. Now 
That's because there's multiple masks making up that word. See, here's the individual masks you can choose from. That's some effects work off of masks. Radio waves works off of masks. So that's one of the reasons why you could turn your letters into masks. And then you get just different effects as you mess around. Duplicate my font right here. And that'll duplicate not only the effect, but the fonts. And now I can change the letter. So now I've got the F and the O, and I can change the direction of those to however I want. You can add puppet pins to the shape that we made out of the font. So if you find a font that's not quite the look you want, you could distort it a bit and also animate it. Just remember, move the playhead, then move your pins. And you're not just pinning down what you want to move, you're pinning down what you don't want to move. Endless possibilities with type when you're doing your title sequences and your credit sequences. Holding Alt or Option right here when you click, that'll change from 8-bit to 32-bit. But when I go back up to my effect up here, see this warning sign, that means something's wrong. And I know for a fact it's gonna say, you can't do liquefy 32 bits per channel. Yeah, there it is, it's giving me the warning right there. So I just go back here, change to 8-bit. Now let's try doing liquefy on these outlines. And I had my toggle mask and path off. That's why I couldn't see anything. Remember, anything with a stopwatch can be animated over time. And don't forget, when you choose your shapes, instead of drawing a shape, you get less options. See, I drew this rectangle instead of using the rectangle tool, and now I can get into the path because I drew it as a path. You cannot do that with a rectangle that was drawn with the rectangle tool. Just a reminder. And when you're morphing and animating shapes, you might need to use multiple shapes to get what you want. Like if I wanted to have some eyes come on here, I would do that as a, its own shape layer. And if you want to apply effects to a lot of things, sometimes you got to pre-compose them all together. And remember, always mess around with your drop downs. See the difference between 
luminescence, the light value, and alpha helps maintaining the alpha of the shape. So I'm going to see what happens. I know that some of these effects might not work in a 32-bit. We'll find out. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to see what happens if I keep it at 8, pre-compose it, and then make it 32. And I'm going to go check the chat and the email while this renders. And this is a long way from the shapes that I started off with. It's just a matter of what you pre-compose together, how you pre-compose it, and troubleshoot what some effects will and won't let you do. So, like I said, make the most of this lab time. Ask as many questions as you like. And remember, it's all about pushing your ideas and experimenting and trying different things and just uh, being playful because you never know what you're going to end up with. You just try it little by little. And also remember how you have your effects in your layer stack will influence how they interact with one another. So also mess around with that. Remember, grayscale images like this map I made can be used as displacement maps for a variety of effects and blurs, some blurs actually. And don't forget, some blurs add a lot to your render time. 
usually Gaussian blur and fast box blur will render the fastest. The other ones can eat up a lot of time. Repeat edge pixels helps with some of the blurring once you hit the edges based upon how you have your layers stacked. Now do you feel you'll all need a full night of lab time for Wednesday as well to give me more time to field some of your questions and help you along with your projects. It's funny how just a, okay, no problem. Then we can do that, Gabby. funny how just throwing a few layers and effects on top of this, you know, poorly drawn shape changed it so much. Like I said, it's all about exploring and trying out new things. It's almost starting to look like the Eye of Sauron at this point. And don't forget, if you duplicate something in your project panel, you can make changes to it without damaging all your keyframing and effects. But if you duplicate it in the timeline, then you can mess up all your pre-composing. Okay, yes I will, Rachel. Don't forget some maps work off of grayscale values. See the difference when I went from grayscale
going to check the email. Again, you can see how radically these effects change when you turn off and on certain ones. It's all a matter of experimenting and trying different things because you never know what you're going to get when you start and you just got to be patient and mess around with your settings and be willing to experiment and try different things. You see how radically this changed over the course of uh, waiting for some questions.
you can always push your work and it's not me being critical of you. It's just me helping you get your work to grow. Well, to get you to grow as an artist and also to help you push your limits and get some work after you're done with school. Ah, uh, here we go. Here's where it is. Right here. Need those pins. So now, this will end the same way it began. And I can... So rather than copy all those keyframes, I just made sure I have a good loop. That's where I messed up. I didn't continue that out. Okay, so I got to do the same thing here. So the simple fix for that is I copy these, go to my mat, paste them. Now everything should line up. Yep, now we're back on track. Always do a quick scrub through and a check before you waste all that time rendering realizing that a change you made to one layer affects a whole lot of other parts of your design. Any questions out there while I'm still on for another 20 minutes?
I'm just curious to see how long this is going to take to render. Oh, not bad. About nine minutes, eight minutes, good. And it's because this is more or less uh, procedural rather than particle based, uh, because I'm using a variety of maps and I lowered some of my blurs to help speed up the render. Uh, little tricks here and there to shave off some render time rather than spending hours or days rendering something. Especially when you're just demonstrating a variety of techniques and, you know, just brainstorming live on the fly. This changed radically over the evening. And so what I'll do is I will, while well, this is rendering, yep, that's still rendering, good. I'm going to dissect my effects for this. So it started off with puppet pinning the bird and I grayscaled it. And I made sure that the first frame of animation and the last frame of animation were the same. And I just duplicated that pre-comp rather than copy all those puppet pins to have a nice loop. So that was the base. And my original, there's the original. Okay, so start off with the glow. And this is the bird on top. The one below has a bit more of a glow to extend it beyond, uh, as just as a nice little underlying touch. So here's my settings that I did for the glow. Then I duplicated my glow just to get some extra detail. And that's the settings for the second glow. And in between those, I placed Colorama with the fire and smoke default that I got from the drop-down menu under input cycle. I then messed around with my displacement map, which was this, yeah, okay. So what's driving this is this displacement map I made using turbulent noise. Here's my settings. I had a dynamic fractal with a spline. There's my contrast and brightness I changed. And I just keyframe animated the evolution from the first frame at zero to be three full loops. Yep, three full evolutions of that fractal. So that's what's driving this. So the fractal is right there. I named it map. And then I put a displacement map over the bird. And I'm using that map in my pre-comp. And here's my displacements. I then tried the blur, that was too much, and I tried to refine mat that was killing my render. I increased the saturation a little bit. This is the layer below. Uh, the bird below, here's my glow settings. I also colorized the glow. There, I colorized it because it was going beyond the shape of the bird. And there's my second thing. So I wanted a little bit of color to it rather than just some white and black. Uh, this one, I increased the blur because I did not want a harsh edge since this is the glow that's going past the bird. So that one actually turned back on the blur. There's my map. Um, and I altered my map settings slightly on the displacement just to give it a little bit of life, not too much. There's very little difference between these two displacement maps. The top one I did 9 and 25, and the bird below I did 10 and 33. So it's just that little bit of difference that's going to give it a little bit of life there. So without the map, this was a huge fractal mess. You couldn't even tell it was a bird. I'm going to turn off the map just to... See, the glow was way too intense. And I did not want that. I mean, that's kind of interesting, but what's going on beyond it is just too much. So, I made this matte layer, which was 
you know, just the bird that we had at the beginning. And on that mat, here's the displacement. It's a little bit different from the one below it, just to give it a little bit of life. I blurred it a little bit to soften the edges. And that's all I did for that. And let's see if there's anything beyond that. Now I turned off my set mat. Yeah, so I was using set mat and refined soft mat to try and tamp down that glow, but really just a good old fashioned alpha mat and then expanding below it with uh, just duplicating the bird and altering the displacement a little bit and the glow did a much better job and gave it more interest without that wild glow going on around like I get this nice detail going there for the edges like I said it's all just a juggling act of how quickly can you get a pass to your client or you know, just to mess around and learn something new, you don't want to waste a whole evening and then not like what you had at the end of it. And like I said, no one really knows completely what they're going to do getting in. It's always a matter of experimenting and playing around in the end to get the results you want. You can have a rough idea of what you want to do, but there's always going to be some troubleshooting and some experimenting and that's a lot of the fun of motion design and visual effects and messing around in After Effects. This was what it was looking like before and the difference with this effect as opposed to the other one was with this I kept on the uh, glass and the plastic for that one. That's why that was looking so intense and distressed. Like I said, with the grayscale, CC glass and plastic were playing off of that, giving off an even more wild, abstract look. A much more painterly way of going about it. But I went for a more realistic look in the end. You can see how night and day between the two of them. It's all a matter of what you prefer doing. And this was just the glass and the plastic on there. We turn those back on. So that's what that looked like. And then, yeah, that's what that looked like with the glass and the plastic on. You see how it abstracts more of the shape and bevels it out. Like that. So I just turned it off. That right there is a good thumbnail image, I think. And I didn't want to Photoshop the file, so I'm going to just make a JPEG. Sorry about that. And then I hit the render button. There's my JPEG. And let's just take a look at our finished animation. So I hope everyone's well and safe out there. And I will be back Wednesday night, 6 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And I'll be fielding more lab questions. I will not have a lecture this Wednesday to help all my students catch up with their work because of all their finals and everything that's going on. And I'll be fielding any questions in the chat. So make sure you've got your reference files ready and have a great evening, and I'll see you Wednesday.